Okay, folks. This week we're going to get into data and types of data and where to find it and things like that. Last time, you guys were playing around with that South America stuff. I supplied the data files to you. I, I told you what to do with them. Today we're going to learn a little more about what these data files actually are, how they work, where they exist, where you can track them down, and so on. And before we really get into finding this stuff and more practical things, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the files themselves. Now, one important thing to start out with here is an idea, understanding of the two different types of data models that exist. Uh, that we use when we're using this GIS software. Number one, we have vector, and then two is raster. Okay? Now, vector are very uh, simple, straightforward things. It's what we used last week. Um, so, you know, the uh, uh, cities themselves in South America, the uh, river lines, stuff like that. It's anything that's a point, line, or polygon feature class. And polygon simply means some kind of shape, some aerial shape uh, out there. Okay? So three different ways to represent features of the Earth uh, using this vector concept. And you can see on the slide here it says uh, used for discrete data meaning it's used for things that have a, a start and a finish or a beginning and an end, something we can point to, okay? like an actual city center or a country's boundaries or something like that. And a raster is for continuous data. That is data that don't just stop existing. They exist all around us. And classic examples are uh, temperature, there's no place on the planet where there isn't temperature data. It may be colder, it may be warmer, but that temperature data, that those are continuous everywhere you go. Elevation is another example. And so to represent continuous data, we use this raster format, which is simply a grid of pixels. Then the pixels have some kind of value. And the example here is uh, that of a a uh, digital photo. Um, you know, we have this, this barn in front of mountains here, just this generic thing. It's represented. It's not the real barn. It's a representation, and it's using this grid system, and each pixel has a specific color. And the example here, we have two versions of the same image, but of a different resolution. So the first one, right up here, has a much lower resolution. These pixels are much larger in size, which means if they represent one and only one color, there's only so much you can do. You can't really make out what this thing is. But if we shrink our grid squares or our pixels down, and we, again, do the idea of having just one color, we get a much more uh, uh, detailed picture, right? Because we have more pixels because the resolution is higher. And we can do the same thing with uh, you know a variety of continuous data sets. Like the example I gave for temperature, we would have something that's like this, the same concept where it's a grid. Each pixel uh, would have uh, a temperature value inside it. And depending on the resolution, we can get a good idea of what the temperature is like for a specific area. Okay, so vector, raster. Those are the two models that we'll be using. Okay, another thing worth mentioning here uh, as we're going along <laughs> is topology, which is a fancy term. It's a mathematical term. Um, and it's really, with what we're dealing with here, it's referring to the fact um, that certain features will have specific spatial relationships with other features in an area. So this image example is showing uh, that circle. You can see the point C is within the circle, and A and B are outside of the circle. And if we 
tweak space in some way. And next week we'll be getting into this tweaking. We'll talk about projections and coordinate systems and see how we can actually kind of alter the surface of the Earth. Or how the GIS software can do that. But even if we do that, uh, these topological relationships remain in place. So we can squish things, we can pull it apart, but these specific spatial relationships like C being in that shape, A and B being outside, that doesn't change even as we start to distort it. And this is an important thing that GIS can do. We're not going to dwell with it too much. It's kind of a more of a uh, an advanced bit of subject matter, but it's worth knowing just topology right there and what that actually means. Yeah, now this term feature class that I've already mentioned, and I think I may have mentioned it last week as well. It's a it's a GIS thing. It's specifically it's an arc GIS or arc map thing. And so it just refers to some set of spatial objects that are within that same file. So the example here, we have like the roads feature class. There are a bunch of different California roads that we see on the map uh, and because they're all designated as lines we don't have some of these roads are lines other ones polygons it's all the same line concept of vector data uh, we call it a feature class that's how that works so anytime I say feature class I'm referring to one of these things here in the table of contents window that's just the the term we use now, now with these files that we use, we're going to see more of the stuff this week. We, we played around with shape files last time. We'll continue to do some of that. We'll also probably see some geodatabase stuff as well. But it's worth going through here, make sure, making sure you understand some of the different types of GIS data files that exist. So shape files, I've already dealt with. Um, they're very simple files and that's one of the reasons why we've already dealt with them um, because they're easy to post to Canvas and have you guys download and, and all of that. Um, so since we played around with that already, I'm not going to dwell there. Now geodatabases are a more complex concept. It's actually a database uh, itself, hence the term. And so we can have multiple feature classes as well as other things stored within these. And the extensions for these are either a .gdb or .mdb. And that .gdb is a file geodatabase. The .mdb is a personal geodatabase. These are just terms that ESRI came up with. Um, and We'll, we'll see if we mess around with them. Uh, I'll try to point out some of the key things if we do download this stuff. Maybe, in fact, later on what I'll try to do is have you guys build your own so you get a sense of how these things actually work. Very useful. I typically like to work with these things, but with the idea of sending data files to a website and having you guys download it, sometimes computers uh, uh, freak out a little bit or websites and stuff like that do and think that these types of files here with these extensions are something scary. They might be malware or have viruses or whatever. So I don't dwell on them, but it'd be good for you guys to get a sense of how they operate. Yeah, and then a couple other things. Um, grids, this is a raster uh, data file itself. And when you're looking within a folder, you'll see it .adf, although it's kind of hard to um, make this stuff out. And again, it's that raster idea where it's a grid. We have pixels, and each pixel has some value within it. Right? Other files that work well um, with ArcGIS are TIFFs. So we can use things like JPEGs technically you can bring in. Um, but a TIFF file is typically how we store raster, raster data. Or there's this Mr. Sid file, which also works. And we'll, we'll probably see some of that stuff this week. I'll try to get you playing with some of it. And then finally, tables are a very useful thing. And these can be Excel 
spreadsheets. They can be things that are a little more simple uh, than this. And we're going to be working with these later on in a few weeks. We'll learn how to bring tables in, how to actually do stuff with these things. It's very useful. A lot of the work I've done professionally and stuff I still do when I when I play around with GIS, it comes from already having some shapefile or geodatabase that has, say, the you know, countries of the world or counties in California or whatever. Uh, but then I bring a table in with new data and I'm able to do new things. And, and it's pretty cool stuff with a pretty, you know, in a pretty simple way. So we'll play with this table stuff more, um, but be aware of that. Any table, something like a, an Excel spreadsheet, if it has some kind of geographic location tied to these values, you're able to turn that into data and I'll show you how that works like I said in future weeks and now with layers here these uh, um, this concept here these are the the feature classes themselves we treat feature classes as a separate layer once we're in arc map right? which we saw already previously but we bring in uh, a new feature class it gets set here in the table of contents and the cool thing is we're able to drag these up and down remember last time with dealing with the latitude and longitude we could drag that underneath everything else so it's drawn first and we could put the countries on top of that and we can see those much more clearly that's the cool thing with this whole layer idea and it also allows us to get rid of stuff we don't need uh, we can add stuff that we want to add uh, and so that's very useful and I'll, I'll point that out with this week's uh, exercise when we start playing with data as well now another thing that we've already kind of seen but it's worth explicitly talking about uh, is the this attribute table concept so within all of these feature classes, they have some kind of table connected to the shapes themselves. So this very simple idea here. If we're looking at the map screen here, uh, we have polygon one, two, and three. And then back in the attribute table, which we don't see unless we do that whole right click, open attribute table function. Um, within there, we'll have that one, two, three, so they're connected here, and we'll have any additional data we want to add to these shapes themselves. Now, some shape files or geodatabases that you download and find, they may have very extensive attribute tables already formed. They may be very simple, uh, maybe something that you're able to actually work with a little bit and turn into something more complex. But this is the cool stuff right here. This is what makes GIS really useful. It can be as simple as uh, like when we were adding uh, labels to the cities or countries. We can just turn on those labels. It's pulling from the feature or the attribute table. So that's kind of cool. But we can also ask questions of the um, computer itself, right? Like this example here, we have vegetation type. Um, and we also have this classification system. Let's imagine we're looking for some creature, some uh, type of field mouse or something like that. And we know that it tends to exist in grasslands or more scrub vegetation, and it avoids the denser forests. What we can do is we can go in and look at all the places that have that quality habitat or that potentially good habitat to find you know, a, an individual mouse or a population of mice or, or whatever, we can classify it. Prime meaning that's where we're going to find it. Non-prime meaning not going to find it there. And if we have thousands of these different types of vegetation, these different polygons over a study area, we can quickly go through and eliminate places where we don't want to waste our time, right? Focus on the places where we're more likely to find this thing. And so we'll, we'll play around with this later on uh, as well. We'll really get into querying these tables and seeing what you can do with this stuff because there's some pretty cool stuff we can do. Okay, now what we're going to focus on this week 
is looking at uh, acquiring data. How, uh, um, how can we get this stuff? Um, sometimes what we do uh, is we go out with GPS devices. We, we get it with doing our own field work. Right? We're not going to do it in this class. Um, Geography 201 is something where we can start to uh, uh, introduce that to students. But in here, it's, it's going to be uh, already existing data. We're not going to gather it from the field. But it's a very good way to get it for other projects you might uh, run into in the future. Uh, tabular data refers to those tables. And like I said, we'll see some of them. The, there's the concept of digitizing, um, which we'll maybe play around with a little bit um, in this class. We're not going to worry about it this week, though. But that's where we take existing paper maps. Uh, we scan them. We bring them into the computer and we digitize. We turn the data on these maps into digital data that we can bring into a GIS. And I'm going to talk about that concept in a little bit. Uh, and then there are also existing GIS data sources, which I'll take some time going around the web. I'll point out some sources for you guys so you have a sense of where you can find already existing uh, and quality GIS data. And now digitizing, as I said, we're not really going to work with it too much. Um, maybe I'll give you an exercise later on. But this has been a very important way for us to bring uh, analog, you know, paper map data uh, into the digital realm and allow us to use it. So over the past few decades, we've been doing this a lot. Uh, and it's not fun. It's a tedious job. It's obnoxious um, to do, but it, it's something we need to do because for centuries we've stored uh, data on these paper maps and now we have this new uh, cool tool that is GIS but we need to bring that data into that so we can actually use it. Now one important thing here is to think about when you're dealing with existing data you want to question well from where do the, these data come right? Is this the result of someone doing this digitizing of someone tracing an old map or did it come from more modern GPS field methods or, or something like that. Once you know from where your stuff comes, you can get a better sense of should I trust it or how much should I trust this or should I question it here and there. So we want to think about that stuff. And a good example of this, uh, something I learned firsthand, uh, was years ago, back before I uh, started doing this whole teaching gig, I worked in uh, you know the professional arena industry, um, uh, just doing different GIS for some different organizations and groups and in, in some different realms. And, and my last full-time gig was uh, working for a planning department. Uh, and I was charged with the, uh, the task of coming in and actually turning them into a, a digital planning department, really setting up their GIS, uh, saving them time, making sure they had better results and things like that. And one of the first things I, I took on was this uh, stack of maps, these notification maps that existed. And these were amazing, frankly. There was this table, as you see in the photo right here. And these, uh, these maps were just stacked on there. There were like 30, maybe 40 maps here on this table. And so planners, as they're getting ready to uh, set up information for public hearings or to uh, even consider allowing for some zoning change or something like that, the planners would go in here and look uh, where their, their project was and see if there was anybody who needed to be notified, right? Whether it's the county supervisor's office or uh, a specific utility uh, private individuals who just requested to be notified if anything was happening in a specific area. I mean, there were a lot of different entities, whether it's people or agencies or whatever, that wanted to know about stuff. So a planner would walk over here, sit down, and look through it, and it would take anywhere from, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to get all of this information. And then that, that information would be taken over to another group, and they would copy that down and, and make 
you know, envelope labels and stuff to mail out information to specific people. It was a very long, silly task. So I thought, perfect. This is a great thing. GIS, we can fix this. We can make this uh, happen almost instantly rather than being this, you know, multi-hour process with all these different people involved. So what I did was I took these maps and I began to digitize them. And now looking at them, what you can see is that they're, A, not in the best quality. I mean, this one over here is one of my favorites, um, just how stained and well used uh, it was. This is tape along the sides because, of course, it was ripping. Stuff had been uh, um, developed, you know, years before I got there, maybe decades before I uh, got there. So they're in pretty sad uh, conditions. Um, another thing is just looking at how some of these lines were drawn. You can see this wasn't, you know, somebody taking his or her time. You see multiple lines drawn through here. Uh, some stuff is already fading and starting to disappear. This blue highlighter line, one important thing to realize is that really when you look at the thickness of this line and the scale of this map, this line is technically a half mile thick, okay, just in reality, based on where that ink covers it. Um, on this map, that's a half mile wide. Now, luckily, with this specific polygon, I could figure out where they intended uh, the boundaries to be, but that was an issue. That was something I had to think about was what did the original drafter of these lines intend when he or she drew them on here, right? Where should it begin? When I'm bringing this into a digital environment, I have incredible precision so I can get it down to the millimeter of, as to where it's supposed to be. But on here, that covers a huge area. So this is something to think about as you, um, you know, are, are actually digitizing or taking data in, you have to think about what's the intention here. Make sure you're actually digitizing it in the way that was intended. Uh, here's another one that not only could I not run through the wide format scanner, um, just so much information was already lost. And so I did the best I could uh, with some of this stuff, right? So it's just, it's a big challenge with some of these older, already existing paper maps. Okay, more of that stuff. And you can kind of better see how thick this line is here running halfway through these these uh, township sections. But what I did is I went through uh, with all of this stuff, um, put the, the polygons into one geo database, uh, and this is it. This was the end result. And I specifically did it to look very clean, to not have different lines running through here. I uh, um, put together a little button, which is something you can do. Uh, in fact, I think I have, yeah, this kind of underlying code. It's not really even coding, but but it's this thing called Model Builder, which we'll, we're not going to mess with in here. In some of the ad more advanced classes, we do play with it. And it's pretty cool where you can uh, get the computer to do the work for you. Rather than me going in and telling it what to do and clicking a bunch of different stuff, I put in this this workflow hit the button once and the computer does all of the work. So I put this together so that planners could come in, they enter just a little bit of information, and what it does is it spits out this uh, Excel spreadsheet at the end of all this with everybody that needed to be notified. It's set up in a way so you can have Microsoft Office take care of addressing um, letters and things like that. It was all automated. Shouldn't take any time at all. So it looked very cool. Um, but the problem is, as cool as it looked, as uh, clean as everything was, you need to remember uh, that it came from back here, this kind of stuff, right? So it looked very digital, looked very, you know, new and modern and all that, but the data weren't that good to begin with. So you want to think about that as you're going through here, as you're working with data, yeah, here are these two things, uh, compared, um, you want to think about, you know, from where did my data come? 
Was it something that was carefully put together using the latest GPS technology to measure in where stuff should be? Or was it completely created within a digital environment? Or is it somebody taking some archaic map and trying to bring that information into a digital environment? And if so, well, then what was lost, right? What, what isn't there? Or what can I do and what can't I do with this data set? Now, one way in which we can uh, um, learn about our data and its origins and so on is to look into what we call metadata. And quite literally, metadata means data about data. Okay? And this isn't something that we only use in GIS. It's used anywhere you use data, but it's something very important to what it is we are doing. And I'm going to point that out with some of the exercise stuff we do this week. But you always want to look for metadata. If you're producing your own data set, you should be taking the time to generate metadata so that if somebody later wants to use your data set, they know how you did it. They know why you did it. What was the purpose? of this thing which scale was this um drawn to and I'll, I'll get more into scale when we get into the the exercise itself um but yeah little things that would be mysterious to anybody else or, or nobody could have really guess at that's what we need to put into our metadata and we're not going to really make any data in this specific course so we're not going to mess with the creation of it but we'll see examples of what it looks like where you can find this stuff what good metadata are uh, versus the some of the bad stuff i'm sure we'll see that as well 